Uh, hello, uh, my name is John Bryan. I am an interviewer for the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County. And I'm interviewing Mr. Harold Johnson on August the 6th at the Main Library. Uh, welcome, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, how you came to go into the uh, service. Uh, were you a uh, draftee or were you an enlist enlistee? And when did you serve? Okay. On the day Pearl Harbor was bombed, my brother and I were downstairs, we were doing the dishes. And when I heard Pearl Harbor was bombed, I decided then at the end of the school year, I was going into the Navy. And my service record in the Navy begins on the 24th of June, 1942. And uh, we left here and went to Great Lakes. That was myself and, uh, and another shipmate, uh, William Henry Smith, and uh, Crocker Proctor Johnson went to Great Lakes. That's where I had my basic training. And uh, basic training to me was uneventful. Uh, there is nothing in particular that stands out other than the fact that I saw some black men who were not cooks and stewards, who were, uh, who, uh, one was a chief gunner's mate and uh, one was a, a gunner's mate first class. But the Navy was discriminating like the rest of society was segregation, and there had to be a concerted campaign to open up opportunities. And it took a direct order from President Roosevelt to open up the Navy and the United States Marine Corps. Why, why did you choose the Navy? Uh, because uh, the Navy and the Marines were more segregated, more discriminatory. And then other branches than the army, it, even though all of them were, mm -hmm. but but the navy and the marines had a, a reputation. Oh yes. Uh, as I think about it, there was no special reason that 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 I can think of for joining the navy, mm -hmm. but that was what I did. Uh, and what were you? You did your basic. <clears throat> At Great Lakes, mm -hmm. uh, then you went to uh, school. All right. Okay, from Great Lakes, I went to the Navy Service School at, uh, it was at uh, Hampton Institute in Virginia. And we got down there in September. And that was a most enjoyable experience. In fact, I tell people that my time in the Navy during World War II, was almost like being on a vacation. My experience with discrimination and racism was minor in comparison to what some of my friends went through. So we get down to Hampton. Let me stop you just for a second. Uh, Hampton, uh, historically black mm -hmm. college. Okay. Uh, uh, at the time we were there, it was Hampton Institute. It is now Hampton University. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there we were trained and uh, uh, some of us went to diesel school, some of us went to machinist mate school. Uh, some of them, some of the men trained as electricians. What stands out about Hampton was I was fortunate the first company there, the first group of blacks to be trained in uh, technical fields in the Navy was at Hampton. And fortunately, the captain down there was Howard Downs. And I remember Captain Downs called us together after we had got on the campus the first day and gave us a talk that I will 
always remember down stood up various body. He was a six foot big white man. He addressed us as men. Now let me put that in context. We're in segregated America. 1941, lynching, violence, white men, at, and particularly in the South, do not address you as, as a man, you're a boy. And down said, men, you're here to be trained, and I want you to do your very best when you leave here and go out to the various stations to serve, I want to hear a call, send me a Hampton man. And from that group also came some of the first, or rather the first group of black uh, naval officers. Uh, again, this was highly unusual because most of the uh, blacks in the Navy uh, were the equivalent of the service of supply in the Army in terms of uh, being cooks and stewards and, and uh, not uh, trained to be uh, technicians or to be infantry uh, men in, in the Army. So uh, how did this school come to be established at Hampton? Uh, to train uh, blacks for more technical jobs. Do you have any idea how it came about? Well, well a, again, there were these demands, and I think that it may have had something to do with uh, <clears throat> do with the Armstrong family. Armstrong was the founder, well, was one of the key people in starting and uh, uh, in starting Hampton Institute, and uh, and his son was commander of Great Lakes. And let's face it, getting something like that required uh, getting a program like that on your campus required uh, some political connection and influence. Uh, it might be useful to go back and talk a little bit then about how uh, Hampton uh, was started as uh, coming after the Civil War uh, as one of the uh, freedmen schools. Uh, and General Armstrong uh, was a uh, white general in the Civil War that was the superintendent at Hampton. And so he had the influence. Uh, and of course, Hampton was designed to uh, train uh, blacks in technical fields. Uh, the, this. One, is, one of the surprising things for me when I got down to Hampton was to see on the college level people being trained in the trades that here in Cincinnati, you got that at the high school I level. <laughs> because it was, it was, that's what it was. Uh, uh, back up for a second, who's the most uh, famous uh, alumnus to come out Somebody of Somebody by the name of Booker T. Booker T. Washington, Washington <laughs> was an alumnus of, uh, of Hampton, and of course he went on to found uh, Tuskegee. Tuskegee, yes. Uh, so it's interesting that the sort of connection here. Uh, Tuskegee is where the airmen oh, yes. were the trained. Tuskegee airmen. airmen. And at, at Hampton, uh, there was the training of, uh, of blacks uh, for technical and, and, and mechanical areas uh, that uh, uh, was different from being a cook and a steward. Yes. After you left Hampton, then what? Okay. <clears throat> we went to San Diego, California. <clears throat> and we got to San Diego, California. And we reported in. John Regan 
was in charge of the draft. John was an electrician, a third class. My rank at the time was fireman first class. And uh, we got there in January, so we were in our overcoats. We walked in and this group of white men and this chief looked at us and assumed that we were stewards. Mm -hmm. And uh, John said, no, I am electrician third class and all of these men have technical readings. And the conversation stopped there. But let me give you a little a little more about John, Johnny Regan, and you may want to come back to him, but I first read about him when he was playing football at Montana State. John was a scholar athlete like you, <laughs> and uh, uh, John was a quiet-spoken, very uh, quiet-spoken, very capable guy. But don't stir him up. He was about 6'2 and a muscular 195 pounds. So you don't want to get John stirred up and you don't want to tangle with him. Uh, but uh, 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 John was one of a group that was known as the Golden 13, the first group of black officers to earn their gold bars in the Navy, the gold braid in the Navy. So you may want to come back to them. But, uh, but there in San Diego, I served on the Y09, and our job was to fuel the ships that came in and out of San Diego Bay. So we fueled everything from small craft to aircraft carriers that carried over 400,000 gallons of fuel. I remember on one, uh, a uh, fuel emission. We were fueling this destroyer that had just come back from the combat zone in the uh, South Pacific before we had gained control. And so we were talking and he said to me, he said, uh, tell me, how do you rate this duty? Now mind you, this guy, if he come back from combat, so I said to him, I said, it was reserved for me. Now, I didn't go into an elaborate explanation about racial segregation and discrimination, but my answer was simply, it was reserved for me. Um, how did you get selected? I'm, I'm going back a little bit. How did the group that went to Hampton? Test. Uh, how the uh, test. test that you uh, that you took, mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, uh, they were opening up uh, this uh, branch of service to African Americans, and so the tests were taken, and and, uh, and you uh, and went to Hampton, and now you're uh, assigned to your duty mm -hmm. uh, in San Diego. Okay. Uh, when we got to San Diego, we were in a separate area, we slept in a separate area, we worked together, but, 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 but we didn't live together. And then as I remember, they also had a separate section for us in the dining room. And, uh, that there were men from all over the country. And uh, we had, uh, uh, um, I remember this one night, I walked into the shower room and I overheard this voice say, it's no sin to be a Negro, but it's so damn inconvenient. <laughs> now, I don't know what he had experienced during the course of that day. Mm -hmm. But in San Diego, when we went out in San Diego, you could go any place mm -hmm. that you had your money to pay for. Mm -hmm. But you did run into discrimination from time to time and 
some of our fellow uh, sailors and Marines carried over the prejudices and discrimination from the society uh, that they grew up in. But fortunately, there were always those few who were fair-minded who did not. And I have the utmost admiration for them, for those whites who stood up against discrimination and sometimes they paid a high price for it. And also for those blacks who stood up and who knocked down the barriers. Now, now you were in, uh, you got out of the Navy in 46. Uh, yes, now, just uh, uh, let me com complete. As the war went on, the Navy, uh, there was a liberal group in the Navy who was pushing for reform. Mm -hmm. And so initially, when they opened the doors for us, we were to be restricted to uh, small crafts that went out 150 miles and to shore bases. And we'll be getting back to this, but also blacks were concentrated in loading ammunition. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 so that you had that. But then, as the casualties started mounting up, I'm being facetious, but some white people are slow learners. And they began to get the idea that now, here, these whites, the white brothers and sisters, whites are going into combat, and, and the blacks are being restricted and are being, uh, they're not going. And so they started sending them overseas. And uh, men were assigned to combat ships, combat vessels. But this is what they ran into. One of my fellow sailors, who was a radio man, was assigned to this ship and was on a small craft being taken to the ship. And somebody on the officer's deck looked out in field glasses and saw him and waved him off. What the Navy had to do was to send down an order that when we assign this black man to this ship, he goes on this ship and you cannot move him without getting approval from us. Uh, was there reluctance uh, to essentially arm the black soldiers and sailors when, when they were in the service of supply of truck drivers? They didn't have, they didn't have weapons. Uh, uh, the men did run into that problem. Uh, now, within the Navy, the only time I handled an arm, uh, when I had a firearm, was uh, when I was on the firing range. But, uh, but uh, when I got overseas and I learned this, that some of those men, once they got guns and ammunition, they always kept some stored. And uh, one of my fellow sailors, uh, Bob Southgate, told me standing down on Sixth and Vine, he said, I was in nine race riots. And he looked over and he said, I don't trust those white people. And he told me that uh, when he was on Guam, there was a race riot and it was about men were uh, fighting over women. And the Marines came down in their area. He said, they drove into the area, a submachine gun mounted on a Jeep and just sprayed. And he said, they were running. And this one little sailor, he was 
He ran like a bat out of hell, and they got angry at him because he was running so fast. He dove underneath the tent, the floorboard, and came out. The next time that jeep came by firing, he took it out with a hand grenade. One of the most tragic experiences during World War II is when we had American soldiers killing each other over this racism and discrimination. Uh, let's go back for a second because uh, uh, you sort of imply, I think, uh, that uh, there were girls uh, that the white soldiers consorted with and girls that the black soldiers consorted with. In, in terms of uh, their uh, off-base activities? Well, this. Okay, on Guam, it, it was just the Guam women. Now, when you get to Europe, when you get to Japan and other places, it's different, but one of the most humorous things is that uh, some of these prejudiced whites they had a scientific mind. They made an anthropological discovery that the physical anthropologists had missed. And that was that black males had tails. And so they told the women mm -hmm. that these guys have tails. And so uh, when some of them heard it, some of them would pull down their pants and show. <laughs> you see. Uh, 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 I, 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 and then the place where they had the most serious clashes was where there were white women. And one of the experiences that the blacks had when they got to Europe was to meet white people who did not display the prejudice and discrimination that they were used to at home. One of my shipmates tells about when he landed in Ireland. And he was almost in a state of shock when the Irish were referring to him. You are an American. No. And my friend was in a state of shock. And then in England, it got so bad until Walter White, who was the executive secretary of the NACP was uh, uh, called over there to, to observe and to make recommendations to Eisenhower. And uh, uh, some of the soldiers, they resented it when white women and black men were together and there was violence. Uh, I probably got you a little bit ahead of the story. Uh, you were at San Diego. Uh, where did you move from San Diego? Because you ended up talking about Guam. Uh, uh, well, this. Before we leave California, I was stationed in San Diego, California, when those two ships exploded at Port Chicago. And uh, the men were, uh, the men refused to load ammunition and were court-martialed now. now if you, uh, uh, and uh, Thurgood Marshall, the chief counsel for the uh, NACP, went there and was umpired for the Navy, and he made recommendations and criticisms. Thurgood Marshall said that Port Chicago court martial was the worst white war that he had ever witnessed. And uh, the men's uh, sentences were reduced, but 
but they did get, uh, uh, I think it was maybe a uh, bad conduct discharge. And uh, that incident had been written up exhaustively by uh, Robert Allen in a volume entitled The uh, Port Chicago Mutiny. And to this day, I have questions about the Black Caucus because when they were in the majority in Congress and Ron Dellums was head of the Armed Forces Committee, they could have called for, they could have called for an investigation. Now, one member did get a pardon from I think it was uh, President Clinton. Uh, you were in San Diego when the explosions took place in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Port uh, Chicago. Uh, did you hear about it? Oh, oh yes. And, and, and the, 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 yes. How did it? Yes. Well, it was on the front page of the papers. It was on the front page of the. Uh, it was on the front. Page of uh, the black newspapers, the uh, Pittsburgh Courier, the Chicago Defender. One of the things I dealt with when I was in the Navy, some of the men didn't deal with it, didn't want to talk about it. But this here you are in the United States Navy and President Roosevelt, all of this rhetoric about the four freedoms, and here you are being segregated and in some cases being treated like dirt. And some of these people, they have no problem in demanding that you sacrifice your life. Now that I had a problem with. And so I'm trying to understand what's going on and to understand this. Gunnar Myrdal's An American Dilemma came out. And uh, that study, I bought every volume and read it. When I bought that, I bought a dictionary. And I read it. And then there was another volume that came out that same year, 1944, uh, that doesn't get the recognition that it's deserved. Rayford Logan edited a volume entitled What the Negro Wants. And he did this at the request of the editor of the University of North Carolina Press, then by the name of Couch. And when Couch got the manuscript, he was in a state of shock. Couch wanted Booker T. Washington's thing to be there. Booker T. Washington was, they call him a conservative. Washington felt his viewpoint was that if black folks proved themselves, character, education, and thrift, that you would get your rights. Well, now we know that that was a serious error because this racist structure did not yield to that. You've got to go at it directly. And so the bombshell and what the Negro wants, Rayford Logan, in the lead article, Rayford Logan is a World War I veteran, and he was so angry and frustrated until after he was discharged, he lived in France for five years before he came back to the States. And in Rayford Logan's article, he had the gall to write and demand full freedom now, and he coined the phrase, the irreducible minimum. And the irreducible minimum, among other things, was the sacred cow, segregation. He said, the abolition of public segregation. We were not supposed to make those kind of demands in public. In the minds of some people, we were not supposed to speak that way. 
You be nice, behave yourself, do what you're told, and we'll dole your rights out to you when we see fit. Uh, now, Rayford Logan was, a, uh, was on the faculty at Howard, at Howard University. University. Uh, you uh, apparently did a lot of reading while you were in the Navy. You, you, you and talked, I still do. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but you talked about the uh, Pittsburgh Courier and yeah. uh, the Chicago Defender, Chicago uh, which were two uh, African-American publications uh, that uh, that's where you got some of your information about uh, the uh, explosion. Yes. Uh, how about uh, A. Philip Randolph and the, and the uh, march on Washington that they talk about the carrying out in 1941? Were you? Okay, this. I follow that. And in the march on Washington, one of A. Philip Randolph's demands at that time was the abolition of segregation in the armed forces. Uh, that was dropped, but Randolph was one of the most courageous, eloquent men uh, at that, or rather, d during that time, and one of the giants in the civil rights movement, and not only that, but Randolph had that broad vision. He saw all of these things together, and Randolph came at it from a uh, socialist point of view, but Randolph was a thorough Democrat, and he did not hesitate to speak his mind. It's reported that when President Roosevelt was trying to dissuade him from the march on Washington, that uh, Roosevelt, uh, one of his tactics, if he didn't want to talk about something, was to divert your attention. And so Randolph was eloquently setting forth his demands, and Roosevelt decided to flatter him. And he said, Phil, what year did you graduate from Harvard? And Phil said, I did not go to Harvard. And now, let's get back on the issue. <laughs> uh, you are a, a young man at this point in time. Yes. Uh, 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 fresh out of high school. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet you are uh, very much involved and conversant with the social issues, the race issues at that time. Uh, did you have some sense that your work in the Navy, what you were doing in the Navy, uh, was in some way involved in making things better for African Americans? Well, that, the, as I think back, the primary impact of World War II was to make me more conscious and aware of aware of the issues and how we were dealing with them and what we had to do. I make no bones about it. My viewpoint was selfish. And look, I, I said I'm going to do my duty in the Navy. I'm not going to hesitate if it means fighting and dying, going into combat, I will do that. But if I survive, I am going to demand my rights. And somehow I got it in my head to this, that I must be prepared to fight for every inch forward. Some of my fellow veterans, one in particular, some of them think, well, look, we went there and served, and we shouldn't have to fight and demand. My understanding of human history, is we human beings, we can yak yak about freedom for me and for we, but sometimes we have no problem in violating the freedom of our fellow human beings. So to me, is 
you've got to be prepared to fight and defend your freedom and hopefully you will get broad-minded enough to recognize that we're all here together and that you will fight for the freedom of your fellow human beings on this planet. Uh, and that's, that's the, that's what you came out of the Navy with, with that? Well, that is what I developed over a period of time. It, it was not as conscious as it is now. There's another incident. When I came home, I met the black chief who signed me into the Navy. And we were talking. His last name is Alexander. Uh, and we were talking and he said, Harold, you have to face the fact that this is white man's country. And I said, I cannot accept that. And now I add over my dead body. Because if you're going to endure freedom, you have got to be prepared to pay the price for it. And uh, unfortunately, most people, some people, are not going to recognize you as a fellow human being, you and your children and grandchildren, and say, we're all here together, and let's see how we can take care of each other and make this world a better place. Uh, you uh, served in Guam for how long? No, I, 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 uh, uh, this. I didn't get to Guam, but I got to the uh, uh, Philippines. Philippines. I was on the island of Busan, and I was I was on the island of Samar. And in the Philippines, I was on the outer fringes of two racial incidents. I remember, I think it was in December of '45. I heard gunfire on the base. And then there was an announcement that there would be no movie, and I went there and I was told that somebody was going to throw a hand grenade into the movie, so I left the movie. And then that night, about 2 o'clock in the morning, they came around a white sailor and a black sailor, and they were doing a shakedown, looking for guns. And then on the island of Samar, there was an incident, and they called us out on the field and there were uh, 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 there was uh, this marine officer and he was saying to us well uh, if there are any problems uh, we can talk about them and try to work them out and we were standing down on level ground behind us were some hills and I was, and I was standing and I said if some crazy guy gets back there with a machine gun, we are sitting ducks. And then I remember hearing this big 200-pound sailor almost start crying and calling for his mother. <laughs> I thought, um, I suspect that some people might say, sounds peculiar, how much race uh, was a conscious part of your service in the military uh, that might be quite different from the consciousness of a white service man uh, that would not have race uh, so much a conscious part of uh, his military service and yet for you uh, it was always there it seemed to me well this is as i say my experience was minor some of the experiences that my uh, 
friends I had. One of my fellow Navy men to a steward mate, Bob Lane. Lane was in the invasion of North Africa, the invasion of Southern France, and he manned a machine gun on the ship. He tells of being in Florida on a naval base, and he could not go into the canteen to buy. He gave his money to German prisoners of war to go in to buy things for him. And then he tells about being on a troop ship guarding German prisoners of war. And some of them had been in the States, and they knew about discrimination. And they were taunting him about being discriminated against. And Bob went to the captain and said, Captain, this is what's going on. I want you to get me off that duty because if you keep sending me back, I'm going to shoot somebody. And so the captain took him off. And then some of the white guys were naive. For example, one of the Tuskegee Airmen out in California, they played basketball in high school together, and so they're going to join the Army together. And they go down, no, no, no. No, no, no. Now, uh, of the high-ranking military officers during World War II, I am critical of General Eisenhower. Eisenhower did not take the initiative. During the Battle of the Bulge, Ike did not embrace the idea of, of having black volunteers. But the manpower barrel was getting low. And there was one officer on his staff who's a classmate of Bill Hastings at Harvard Law School who argued and who kept arguing and he told Ike, he said, look, we've got to act now because if we don't, the casualties are going to be mounting. And there was this one officer who failed to act in a timely fashion and was court martialed. And when I heard that, he said, okay. And they started the paperwork. And so those men. Now, another issue during World War II, and historically where blacks are concerned in the armed forces, there's one historian who described the black experience in the military. When, when wartime comes, first, we were rejected. Second, we were restricted. And then we were recruited. And of course, uh, now, he refers to those as the three R's. From my reading is a fourth R, and that is recognition. Recognition for your service and valor. If some of the powers that be had had their way during World War II, one, we would have been restricted to menial roles, and we never would have been in combat because some of these races, they are realists. Say, look. If I consider these people inferior, if I want to keep them down, then I'm not going to train them in combat skills. Now, uh, uh, this. Blacks have won the Congressional Medal of Honor in every war, in every major conflict. World War I, Willie Stowers didn't get the Medal of Honor. He was awarded to his cousin after a review was done to see if that was discrimination, to see if that was discrimination in the 
recognition process. And they're going over the paperwork and they find stars from World War II. The man had been recommended and approved, but somehow the paperwork got stuck. World War II, for a long period, there were no black Congressional Medal of Honor winners until June 13, 1997 under Clinton. There had to be a review of those who had received the Distinguished Service Cross, which is one notch below the Congressional Medal of Honor. And those records were reviewed, and seven men got the Congressional Medal of Honor. John Robert Fox from Wyoming. Uh, you were Fox was in the 92nd Division. He and his men were manning this post. They were being overrun by the Germans. And he ordered he requested artillery fire on his position. Approval came from the top. And one of his personal friends had to issue the order mm -hmm. to fire. The, there's only one living Congressional Medal of Honor winner now, and that's uh, Norman Baker. Again, the 92nd Division, and the 92nd Division was commanded by a man who considered blacks to be inferior, General Allman. You were uh, in the Philippines? Yes. Uh, this was after the war was over. I did not get overseas until after the war was over. Until after the war was over. So when, so when the uh, uh, bomb was dropped, Okay, on VJ Day, I was at, I was at Camp Elliott, California. We were scheduled to go overseas, and we did go overseas. But as far as I'm concerned, there was no reason to send us overseas. But we were sent overseas, and I didn't do one good day's work while I was overseas. <laughs> So by the time you got overseas, essentially the war yes. was over. Do you, do you remember VJ uh, Day? Yes, on VJ Day, I was at, I was in Camp Area, California. When we got the news, there was a minor celebration, and then I remember we were called in for a war orientation lecture, and this officer stood up and he. Uh, what he said didn't impress me then and it didn't impress me now. Uh, he said we dropped the atomic bomb and he quoted something that the Pope had said and he said the Pope doesn't understand that we wanted to kick the blank blank so and so out of the Japanese. And here we here we've got this historic event, and uh, uh, that was all that he had to say about it. <clears throat> now, General Marshall was a fair-minded guy, but again, Marshall was not a pioneer. Uh, uh, and Marshall talked about fighting spirit and morale. And that was one of the things that concerned me. And that black soldiers, men and women, had to contend with it unless they submerged it down to the unconscious level. And I'm wondering what went through the minds of some of the black soldiers when they saw the documentary that was made by Frank Capra entitled Why We Fight. Now, I didn't see that movie, but I was wondering, but is as 
some of the black say and as other minorities who, who were in the armed forces, they say, we fought two wars. We fought the enemy and we fought against discrimination, racial discrimination. Uh -huh. 60 years later, uh, where have we come? Well, this. I've, uh, John Hope Franklin has written his autobiography. And Franklin is kind of, he's kind of pessimistic, skeptical. He wonders about the human capacity to live up to these high ideals. I have qualifications there. If we keep behaving the way we're behaving in an irrational manner, we got serious problems. If we don't learn how to resolve our problems in a nonviolent, constructive way, the future's not bright. But I'm an optimist, and as I thought back over World War II, 50 million people killed, and sometimes when I think about my classmates and friends who didn't come back, you ask the question, was it worth it? In my view, as long as we have maintained the alternative of struggling for a democratic society that recognizes human rights, it's worth it. And the, the, the black service experience in World War II uh, laid the groundwork or Martin Luther King Jr., Colin Powell. Yes, yes, yes. I, uh, we stand on the shoulders of those who come before us. Sometimes we don't know what they did. Sometimes you run into some people around here who think, well, I made it all on my own. And uh, they don't know what some people went through, black and white, to open these doors and the opportunity that we take for granted. I cannot remember the last time in American society in recent years that I was consciously aware that I was being discriminated against. Uh, uh, There was just one instance where I was going to a conference in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I was on the plane with this guy, this white guy, who was going down in business, and we were talking, and we both went to the same hotel. He got a room, and I didn't. And I later learned that it was discrimination because I was told that the uh, regional conference of the uh, in, of, of the uh, in, NACP that they had reserved rooms, but this clerk told me no, so I had to go check into a third-rate hotel. But. As I look at things now, and as I look at these younger generation of leaders, and as I look at the broad problems that we're facing, you cannot get beyond leadership, and leadership at all levels. Juan Williams has written a book that I uh, that I've heard him talk about, and I look and I listen to these young people 
and I look at how our institutions are being managed, and in particular the public schools and the Cincinnati public schools, what it comes down to is leadership at all levels that must be fostered and developed, and this leadership must be committed to values that respect the individual, opportunity for development and to contribute. And then we've got to recognize that, uh, that in order to deal with these complex problems that we have to have the competencies. You can't solve these problems with ignorance. You can't solve them with emotion. And, um, and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. My concern now is with education in the Cincinnati Public Schools in continuous improvement. We moved up from academic watch. But there are black and white teachers all over this country who have solved all of these problems we're talking about where students are learning. They, uh, teachers are learning, everybody is learning, and they're moving, they are moving forward. We don't have to reinvent the wheel, but there's got to be that commitment, that moral commitment that is backed up with the intellectual capital. Could you have in 1945-46 no blacks in professional baseball, no blacks uh, in uh, the uh, cabinet uh, positions uh, uh, that you'd have a day when there would be a Cohen Powell as the uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Uh, no, no, no. I, um, uh, um, uh, as I look at it, I've seen changes, and since I consider myself to be a historian, I put it in historical context, and I say I have seen changes and enjoyed these fruits that when I went into the Navy at 18, that was not on my conscious mind that during my lifetime, I would see uh, Colin Powell as a Joint Chiefs of Staff, or Thurman Marshall on the Supreme Court, and uh, uh, people in every day situations here in Cincinnati, the schools, uh, black and white teachers together. When I was coming along, I never had a black public school teacher from Kirby Road School to Hughes. And now it's the norm. There were only four schools yes. that uh, blacks could teach at. Yes. Uh, Douglas, Sherman, Jackson, and Stoke. Mm. Uh, but you came along. Yes. Yes. And uh, uh, that now, uh, I remember in 1953, I went to the uh, when NACP National Convention in St. Louis. And I remember Thurgood Marshall speaking, and at the time, the Brown decision was still, uh, was still in a document before the Supreme Court. And I remember Thurgood Marshall saying something, I cannot paraphrase it. I can't quote it directly. Uh, paraphrased but it was something like this. He says that in this litigation effort for our constitutional rights, he said, we intend to enforce equality.
from the lower regions of heaven to the upper limits of hell. He said, all over this area, we intend to enforce equality. And I was wondering whether Thurgood Marshall was promising too much. And then a friend of mine who was on the national staff told me what he says, we're going to do so and so with the 14th Amendment. I said, no, I'm promising too much. Now, I assume all of us may remember where we were when we got the news of the Brown decision. I was a ninth street. Gentlemen, excuse me, we are out of time. I need to change the tape. Uh, would you talk just a little bit about the, this, uh, the, you have been very, very socially active in terms of working with the NAACP and uh, other uh, items after you, after you got out of the military. Uh, so would you talk a little bit about that for me? Okay. This, I served as president of a local branch in uh, served president of the local branch in 1950. Uh, there, uh, one issue that stands out there are others, but one issue was we were dealing with segregation in swimming at the high school. Mm -hmm. Now, at Hughes High School, the boys swam together, the girls didn't. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm told that at Walnut Hills High School, the blacks would swim the last period on a Friday and the pool would be empty. Uh, you know what your experience was at Withrow. At Withrow, same thing. And, uh, and so I wrote a letter to the board demanding that the uh, swimming periods be desegregated. And they appointed an advisory committee, and I was on the advisory committee, and I got there, and at the first meeting, nothing happened. So at the next meeting, I came in with a written motion to desegregate the swimming pools immediately. And that got on the floor. And I remember the principal of Withrow. Uh, A.O. Matthias. He turned, turned to me and said, Mr. Johnson, do you realize I'd have to change all these programs? And if Mr. Johnson had said what was going through his mind at that time, it would have been, I don't give a damn how many programs you have to change. Now, <clears throat> the motion was put on the floor without setting a time for the desegregation. And so I voted, to, so I proposed an amendment to make it immediate. There was one vote for my amendment, mine. And then, I, then the superintendent, Mr. Corey, he said, well, I was hoping that we could come up with something that would satisfy the Negro community. And I'm young and naive, and I said, there's nobody here who can speak up for the Negro community. I said, one individual can challenge this decision, and I hope they do. And then Attorney Myron Bush, who was acting, he sort of leaked that there might be the possibility of a lawsuit. And so the board got the message, and the change was immediate. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, back during that time, if you were black and if you were demanding your rights now, that you were a communist. And so I'm told that people want to know whether Harold Johnson was a communist. And uh, Reverend Sims, who was a pastor of Brown's Chapel, uh, uh, we were talking 
And he said, uh, Johnson, he said, some men called me up and they called up twice and they wanted to know if you were communist. And so uh, Mr. Sims said, said, as far as I'm concerned, Mr. Johnson's not a communist. He just has the courage of his convictions. We, we should uh, probably interject here. This was the Joe, Mc Joe McCarthy era mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this time period. And also uh, that the NAACP with the national office was placed on the House Un-American Activities Committee. Yes. Uh, um, uh, the communists made an effort to control the NACP. Uh, that's the way I would do it. So the NACP is being phase one with the effort externally of the communists and their, and their adherence within the organization trying to control. And then externally there were those who were branding us as communists. And for some of us this was laughable. Mary McLeod Bethune, a communist, Walter White, a, a communist, uh, Benjamin Mays, a communist, <laughs> you know, and of course we know what uh, uh, Martin Luther King went through, a communist, and uh, J. Edgar Hoover and the uh, military intelligence had this obsession that blacks were being influenced by communists. Now, there were a few blacks who were, but the rank and file, uh, the communists were irrelevant. We had enough of a problem contending for our rights as American citizens without having to carry that communist baggage. But it, 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 a, there were a lot of people who were branded and uh, their lives and their uh, careers uh, were destroyed. And after, the, after the service, uh, you came back and you used the GI Bill? Yes. Uh, and uh, enrolled at the University of Cincinnati. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, what employment did you hold? Uh, uh, okay, uh, now I retired from the VA Medical Center in 1986. I was in a supervisory position there. And I also had a uh, part-time responsibility as an equal employment opportunity counselor. And when people had complaints of discrimination, they had to see a counselor and you started at the informal level. And uh, you went up the line. That was interesting work. I remember after being in a counseling session with a complainant, I had a conversation with the uh, assistant director who was by profession a uh, psychiatric social worker. And so I was telling him about talking to people who were involved in complaint and I said, I have formulated a new psychological law and it is the law of unlimited perception, which means that a given event can be interpreted in an infinite number of ways. And the assistant director from his psychiatric social work background, he said, that's known as schizophrenia. <laughs> Think about it that way. 
I guess it probably is. <laughs> uh, you are also a historian, obviously, from the conversation here and I've had that uh, uh, you have uh, uh, a vast knowledge of the African American experience in and out of the military. Um, did you all, you, in fact, you sort of indicated that you started having this kind of interest uh, really as a young person fresh out of high school? Well, I have to pay t tribute to my Sunday school teacher. When I was in high school, he handed me a copy of Dr. Woodson's The uh, Negro. The Miseducation? No. No, no, the uh, Negro in our history. So I read that. And then when I got into the service and I had to deal with this issue, uh, uh, that was when I started reading and I collected a library and it took me a while to learn that I could not carry a small library around with me. <laughs> So that when I went overseas, I mailed it home in a, in a, in a trunk. But, uh, but uh, the historians that have influenced me, of course, uh, uh, Pioneer, uh, George Washington Williams, W.B. Du Bois, and then the giant where we can there are periods that you can go before and after, before Woodson and after Woodson. And then John Ho Franklin, and now I'm so pleased. We've got a young group of black and white scholars. I am sure that uh, Woodson would be in ecstasy to see the work that they are coming out with because Woodson at Harvard was told that black had no history. And uh, of course, he took that as a challenge. And uh, now uh, uh, Franklin, and his autobiography and uh, Philip Fonner and then the work that is being done now and as I sit here being recorded my mind goes back to the, those black veterans who served in the Revolutionary War War of 1812, Civil War, all of these conflicts and it's been an uphill battle getting recognition, getting our story in the documents and in the history books. I don't declare victory. We can declare victory prematurely, but as the decades mount up for me, I am pleased at what they have done and at what they are doing. But we must keep in mind that we still have to deal with that irrational, racist, vile element in human nature that comes in all shapes, sizes, and genders and sexes. Because they are out there and they are active and we cannot underestimate them and we must be vigilant and we must be proactive and not wait. Uh, I think with that, I'm going to uh, thank you ever so much for coming and talking with us. Uh, it has been an extreme pleasure.
communicating. And it's good to have a live audience and a camera. I have been known to argue Supreme Court cases in my sleep <laughs> and to deliver lectures in my sleep. <laughs>